Kia ora koutou, Hello and good morning. My name is Richard Patterson and I'm a technical design manager at Sky here in the UK. Uh, this presentation, this talk, however, is actually about how we've built a greenfield fixed line broadband network over in Italy for Sky Italia. Uh, we haven't quite launched it yet. It's still in a staff trial phase. So uh, it will soon expand to friends and family uh, before fully launching later on this year. It's, uh, it's taken us about two years to get to where we are so far. We RFP'd for pretty much everything in the network. Uh, I believe the only thing, only network element that we didn't go to RFP for are the console servers. So I'm going to try and take that two years worth of effort and distill it down into 30 minutes and uh, try and cover everything from an end-to-end -end network point of view. Um, so focusing on a few things in these sort of high-level functional uh, areas of a broadband network, if we start off on the left-hand side in the access layer, it's, it's 2020, so it's obviously going to be focused on fibre to the home. There will be a, a small uh, pocket of infill VDSL where we don't have uh, fibre to the home footprint, which we'll consume from a uh, third-party wholesaler. Uh, but from a, from a fibre to the home perspective, we'll be delivering this using GPON. And in a GPON network, there are two active sort of components on, uh, that sit either side of the passive network. Uh, and at the head end, or the exchange, is an OLT, and at the home, there is an ONT. We're actually, you can get ONTs which have uh, a CPE router functionality built into them, but we've opted for a two-box solution and putting our Skyhub 4 alongside that ONT. Uh, following on with the GPON, it's uh, a single-strand um, single passive optical network fiber. Uh, using bidirectional or BIDI optics, which means there's a uh, different wavelength for the TX and the RX. It's point to multipoint, so that single strand of fiber is actually split or can be split up to 128 ways. Uh, we are using 64 for Italy. Um, and uh, unlike DSL, the performance isn't really variable. So if it works, you're going to get 2.5 gig downstream down that single strand of fiber. And just to save you running the maths on that, uh, at 64 ways, that means we can uh, offer a guaranteed CIR of around 39 megabits per, per home. Uh, you do have to worry about your optical budget for this. So every time you introduce connectors or splitters or, or even splice it, we'll add some attenuation to that fiber. Uh, and you do have a limited uh, amount of optical budget for that. Carrying on with GPON uh, in downstream, it's 1490 uh, nanometers. Its uh, frames get broadcast to all ONTs on that passive split. Um, <clears throat> the ONT can, uh, can distinguish the frames that it cares about uh, via a little port ID in the frame header. Uh, and then every, uh, every frame there for that particular ONT is encrypted via AES. In the upstream, uh, 1310 nanometers, uh, it's, it's more of a time division a TDMA approach. Uh, so when an ONT first connects to, to the PON network, uh, the OLT will, uh, will do some ranging to work out the distance down that fiber, how far down that fiber the ONT actually is. And then it will configure the ONT with a, with a transmission delay value so that when the ONT is sending frames upstream, uh, they don't collide with, uh, with other frames coming from other ONTs on that fiber. Uh, thankfully, we're not having to manage the passive optical network ourselves. We're actually unbundling uh, a local fiber company's um, fiber in the ground. Uh, this is slightly different to how you're used to unbundling uh, DSL over here. It's not, it's not a shared um, passive network, so there are actually separate o um, passive networks that run uh, alongside ours. Um, the local fiber company can still get cost efficiencies and... and, and uh, cost savings and benefits by sharing the ducting and sharing the, uh, the, the fiber strands within the bundles. So if a, if a customer wants to churn from, from our, uh, our PON network to uh, another competitor's uh, PON network, they, they can still go to, the fiber company can still go down to, um, to that last little point-to-point -point, um, uh, connection in the ground and physically patch it across to the other retail service provider's uh, splitter. They'll probably also want to change the ONT because the ONT is now intrinsically part of the, uh, that access network. 
Um, that pond, the passive network itself, is future-proofed. So uh, something like XGS pond or 10 gig symmetric pond can coexist with uh, existing GPON technologies because it uses different wavelengths. So you could ship a business customer, for example, um, down that same street, a XGS pond coloured uh, ONT, and then have a wavelength mux at your head end splitting off those XGS pond frequencies to a dedicated uh, pond card or different OLT. So that's the, uh, the layer one, the access network. Uh, you've then got to go plug it into something. So we have uh, a bunch of these metro networks around the country and the, these metro aggregation devices, or MAs as we call them. So these MAs aggregate multiple OLTs or multiple um, uh, edge pops containing multiple OLTs into this uh, metro network. The MAs themselves are then aggregated to a transport aggregation layer, um, which uh, aggregates lots of national pops and, uh, and connects them up to the core network. That's the sort of physical topology, but we now need to get the layer two frames from the access to the core or to the BNGs, which uh, the BNGs are responsible for subscriber termination, authentication, and it's the first layer three IP hop into the network from a subscriber perspective. So um, we're building a multi-point uh, layer two VPN using eVPN. Um, it's eVPNs try to they try to get around the, uh, the horrors that you may have experienced using uh, VPLS by, um, by using BGP to signal the VPN itself um, and with efficient Mac learning. What I mean by efficient Mac learning is that uh, unlike VPLS where every PE in the network needs to, uh, or gleans, learns and programs itself using the, the Mac address in the data plane packet itself, um, in an eVPN, the first, the ingress PE that learns the MAC address from that data plane packet uh, does, does that usually. It, it learns and programs itself, but it then signals that MAC address and that Ethernet segment to the rest of the, uh, to all other PEs that are participating in that eVPN uh, via BGP. Uh, eVPN can also, it, it can be deployed as an active active multi homed uh, sort of topology, which means the um, uh, so the Metro Act, the MAs on the left-hand side, when they learn, when they see that first packet coming in, uh, they learn that, um, that, sorry, actually, start again. They, when they see an LACP PDU come in from, uh, from the OLT in this example, the MA0 will look at, that, um, uh, look at that system ID in the LACP PDU, and it will use that system ID to automatically generate the Ethernet segment ID, or A. Uh, it will then, and so will MA1, they will then redistribute that to the network via BGP and all of the other PEs in that eVPN know that they can talk to that Ethernet segment and uh, via either or indeed load balance between both of those uh, MAs. Um, there's also no need for MC lag or horrible spanning tree so that when um, when the, conversely in the other direction, so the, uh, the MAs will also advertise the same LACP system ID to the OLT, so the OLT thinks it's got uh, a, a lag connection to one single device, even though it's multiple there. Um, when MA, I see that MA0 advertises the system ID, um, or the ESI, the Ethernet segment ID, to uh, the rest of the network, when MA1 learns that it's got the same system ID as MA1, that's how it dynamically knows that it's part of an active-active multi-homed topology. So then they start doing the uh, designated forwarder election and work out who's responsible for forwarding BUM packets. Uh, this still isn't ideal for us, so we actually, uh, this, is, this is an interim topology. Uh, we want to get to this, which is a, uh, an eVPN pseudo-wire, or VPWS. Um, the difference being it's a point-to-point -point service, uh, so there is no Mac learning, uh, which helps us with the scale of the boxes, especially the transport aggregation devices at the head end where they can have a lot of Mac addresses flowing through th themselves. Uh, to get to here, we need a, uh, a couple of features to be developed via our vendors. Um, the first one, obviously, is that the BNG needs to be able to handle subscriber termination directly on an eVPN uh, pseudo wire. The other one is that both sides, the MAs and the BNGs, need to understand uh, how this backup control flag works. 
um, and the backup control flag, uh, so the backup BNG will still advertise its Ethernet segment ID B to the rest of the network, but it will set this backup flag to say, don't send me any packets. Um, then there's going to be some vendor, uh, vendor magic to, to sync the state of the subscribers to that EVPN service. Uh, both vendors, thankfully, and there are two vendors, so interrupt's going to be fun, uh, have promised me uh, a, a test firmware version of this feature uh, Q1 this year. Fingers crossed. So that's, that's the layer one, the access, the metro, getting it across the core, um, and yes, yeah, so now we have the, the core side of things. Uh, the core is uh, relatively simple. Um, can't see the pop names up there, but we have two core nodes in Milan and two core nodes in Rome uh, fully meshed together with a bonus link between Rome for diversity for whatever reason. Um, we are, we've gone with Merchant Silicon Vendor, uh, which means there's a much cheaper per gigabit uh, port cost and a lot more high, high density ports there. Um, but uh, it's great at forwarding packets really quickly, uh, very simply. If you want to do anything else on there, uh, it's got, they've got very rigid feature sets and the packet processing, the pipeline of how the packets go through the chip um, can be quite interesting and cause you lots of, uh, lots of, yeah, yeah, lots of configuration problems as well as if you want to try and do something it doesn't quite support it. Um, that's not really that interesting, so the f interesting thing for me uh, that we're doing in the core and indeed down across all of the Metro devices is that we're using segment routing with MPLS and we have no LDP or no RSVP TE in this network. Um, that's interesting, there's a bunch of virtualized route reflectors and add path, ECMP everywhere. So segment routing MPLS. Um, uh, it's, it uses the existing MPLS label forwarding plane that you know and love. Um, there's also an SRV6 uh, variant, but, uh, which uses IPv6 headers instead of MPLS labels, so a very similar feature set. Um, uh, this is not a new protocol. It's extensions to your existing IGP, so um, that's one less protocol to have to manage and operate. And as I said before, there's no LDP or no requirement for LDP or RSVP TE. Um, there's no need for pre-signaled uh, stateful LSPs across the network. So all of the, 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 the label path uh, across your network is the state has kept it within the packet itself. So the label that gets imposed onto the, uh, onto the packet denotes how it gets through the network, uh, which means it's much more scalable. Um, it also, so it replaces RCP TE as well with traffic engineering. So you can, you can stack labels or build a segment list of, uh, of segment IDs to whack on top of that payload in order to define explicit paths through the network. Uh, you can either do this manually on your ingress PE, just like you would build an RCP TE path, uh, or you can have some offline path computation engine to dynamically program uh, the ingress PE. The thing that we're looking for and lo looking to potentially implement soon is, uh, is I think, pretty cool. It's, um, it's using building dynamic SRTE or building S SRTE policy to dynamically define a path through your segment routing network based on the link delay uh, measurements that can be signaled through ISIS. So based on that, we can say whatever the path is looking like at the time, use the lowest latency to pop out at, at that egress node. Um, I've lost all my animations in the slides, by the way, so I'm just going through everything. Um, a quick visualization of how uh, the life of a packet through, an, uh, through uh, a segment routing network looks. It's very similar to how a packet would flow via an LDP uh, signaled network. Probably the main difference is that um, you've got, you've, uh, the ingress PE imposes the label of the exit node, uh, in this case PEX, and when that packet is flowing through the network, uh, even though the middle PEs are swapping the label, they're not putting on a new label, uh, not putting on a different ID to go down each hop, they're just replacing that with the same label as the egress node. Um, and I forgot to mention that in segment routing, um, the segment can be either the, the router itself or it can be an interface, which is important for traffic engineering because now you can say go down this interface or use this interface or use this uh, router. Uh, traffic engineering example, you're stacking labels on and going through the network. I'm going to try and rush through this really quickly now. Um, so we then go through the core network and we get to our BNGs for subscriber termination. 
Um, as mentioned, uh, this does your authentication subscribers of, uh, of your subscribers. We're not using PPPoE in this, we're using uh, IPoE, which is basically a glorified uh, name for DHCP over Ethernet. Uh, there's no chap username and passwords like in PPP, so uh, in IPoE, so we're using port-based authentication, uh, where the access node, the OLT in our case, uh, has a DHBv6 relay agent and can insert uh, all of the physical port-based information into, uh, into the DHBv6 solicit. Uh, we've got 1 plus 1 BNG topology, so they're uh, in an active standby mode um, at the head end, um, using some vendor, proprietary vendor magic to uh, state sync the subscriber information and DHCP leases. And it's, again, it's 2020, so all of these will be uh, using native IPv6 out of the bat with uh, slash 48 PDs. And again, as mentioned, we plan on changing this EVPN ELAN into a pseudo-wire EVPN going forward. Uh, so IPv6, um, BrightPNCC will allocate an LIR slash 29 without question. Um, this, is, this was not enough for our... Uh, projected forecast, so with 500,000 uh, subscribers at slash 48 PD size, uh, we went back with cap in hand and asking for a larger, larger allocation. Uh, there are lots of questions, so many questions. Um, if you're trying to justify having, having to need a larger, slash, uh, larger prefix allocation from a slash 29 when you haven't even built a network yet and zero customers connected to it, it's actually kind of a challenge. So. Um, not to mention that, two years ago, this project was very, very secretive. So uh, having to provide, providing technical network design topologies and geographical locations and stuff is, uh, is one thing, but then having to provide marketing information, uh, forecast growth uh, to a company that um, hasn't signed an NDA, won't sign in an NDA, is, is quite a challenge internally for us. Um, but we got there and thankfully they did allocate us uh, something larger than a slash 29. Um, this example, uh, so we, other uh, LIRs or other, other members weren't so, uh, weren't so lucky. They gave up and they just spun up a new LIR to get uh, another slash 29 of IPv6 space. Um, so again, in the example, they, uh, they didn't even want any more IPv4 space. They had plenty. They spun up a new LIR, uh, got a slash 22 of IPv4 space. Um, and so ironically, they're overly restrictive uh, IPv6 allocation policy actually contributed to the exhaustion of IPv4. Um, we're only we're advertising our recursive name servers via IPv6 only, uh, and we're delivering over-the-top voice services over IPv6. So IPv6 is no longer a uh, an optional feature. Please don't disable it. Obviously, you need IPv4 still. So, uh, as I say, we, we were, it's a brand new network. We, uh, we, had, we had zero. So we spun up a new uh, LIR for a couple of grand, and uh, at the time, you, we did get that slash 22 of IPv4 space. Obviously, you can't do that anymore. Uh, right ran out end of last year. So you're probably going to have to go to the open market and uh, spend, today, you're going to be spending over 20 US dollars an IP address. Um, and unless you've got really deep pockets, deeper pockets than we do, uh, that's still not going to be enough to, uh, to natively assign IPv4 addresses to all of your subscribers. So we've chosen, um, you're going to do some IPv4 address sharing. And to do that, we've chosen a te uh, technology called MAP-T. Uh, MAP, or mapping of address and port, is an IPv4 as a service, which means delivering v4 over a v6, uh, v6 infrastructure. Uh, you, it allows for address sharing, or if you want, you can assign a whole IPv4 address to a particular user. Uh, this, unlike some other IPv4 as a service technologies, uh, you, it doesn't require DNS synthesizing or an, uh, an agent on the end host. Uh, it can operate in both uh, encapsulation or translation modes, but most importantly for us is that it's stateless, which I'll get to in a moment. So again, two flavors of map, encapsulation or translation. Uh, encapsulation, obviously there's more overhead there because you're whacking an IPv6 header on top of uh, the standard payload, um, but you're leaving that IPv4 header intact for when it pops out the other side. 
Translation, there's less overhead. It's not zero because an IPv6 header is larger than an IPv4 header, um, but you're still you're leaving that layer four header exposed to the network for anything that needs to do five tuple hashing across there. Um, but obviously, yeah, and there's, uh, there is loss. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, it's not lossless. So there are attributes within the IPv4 header that uh, don't don't exist in v6. So it's not an entirely lossless translation. Um, quick packet flow. So the, the there's a the NAT44 on the CPU router that you know and love. Um, that still happens. Translates RFC 1918 to uh, to the public v4 address. Then there's the map agent on the CPE, which translates the V4 to V6 across the network and pops out at the map border relay, uh, translates it back into V4. Uh, V6 obviously is side-by-side uh, -side native and bypasses these translation functions. Um, not sure how well that shows up on the screen. A um, little bit more of detail, packet, packet life. Uh, through MAPT. Um, the one thing I will call out here is that uh, if you are doing IPv4 address sharing uh, in this, the, uh, the layer for the, the CPU router no longer has obviously exclusive rights to all 65,000 layer 4 ports. So uh, that the existing uh, NAT44 function on your router has to know that it can only use uh, a certain range of, of ports. So it will do port trans source port translation at that layer as well. Uh, in, our, in our topology, actually, the map border relay function coexists on the, uh, on the BNG itself. But it could be anywhere in the network. It doesn't have to be on the BNG. Um, the key thing for us, as I mentioned, is that it's stateless. So uh, it's, it's stateless because the translation is done, uh, it's an algorithmically uh, translated or encapsulated um, uh, based on predefined rules that you have to configure and, and communicate to a CPE router via DHCP, um, which means there's no, there's no need for either the CPE itself or the border relay to keep track of all of the flows passing through it because it already knows what's, uh, where they need to be translated which means efficient packet processing, uh, cheaper, more scalable hardware, and, uh, and it, it can actually already do this on some of existing hardware out there today without the need for buying expensive NAT-capable hardware. Uh, it's the, the algorithms are, again, based on predefined rules. Uh, this, this basically now links your IPv4 prefix assignments and your DHCP pool management together, which makes things a lot more complicated from a from a management overhead perspective. So you're, you're, you're taking the complexity out of the forwarding plane and putting it into your, uh, your management process. Uh, and I have heard of some jurisdictions that uh, mandate five tuple logging for any v4 address sharing type, uh, type things, which, because it's a stateless, obviously, we're not keeping track of destination uh, host supports, so that becomes a bit of a problem. Um, Last few slides, uh, a bit more on MAPT. So it's, it's stateless, so you could anycast the border relay. You can uh, anycast the external v4 to the internet and the v6 internally, so it doesn't really matter which, uh, which direction um, the packets are flowing. Uh, those of you that have played around with stateful NAT444 can uh, potentially uh, attest to there's no real proper state syncing between um, CG and gateways that works at a great scale. So this could actually be very beneficial for that. Uh, as I said, this is not really a pertinent use case for, for ourselves because our border relay function is co-located exactly on our BNG, which all the packets have to go through from a subscriber anyway. Um, but on that note, uh, our, we, we chose that topology and functionality because um, <clears throat> uh, in our testing, we took, a, we took a representative IMIX value from our Sky UK network, and using that IMIX ratio, we, we pushed those packets through at this uh, border relay function on our BNG, and we got to pretty much line rate on these 4 by 100 gig cards for free without any additional costing for hardware. Um, obviously, there's some licensing costs, but that's better than having to put in lots of hardware, taking up slots and, and lot routers. Um, there's a thing called forward mapping rules. This, again, can bypass the border relay by sending traffic directly. And uh, similarly, if you so desire, you could design your network in such a way to, uh, to, to serve v6-only content to v4-only uh, clients using these rules. 
rush to the end of it, um, but that's all I wanted to talk about. So um, thank you very much. And I know it's a very big rush through lots of things, but questions? How come you decided to uh, deliver the uh, network over GPON rather than XGSPON in the first instance? Uh, so there's a couple of things. There's commercials. There's we don't we don't actually own the passive optical network. So there are commercial things there as well, but costing as well. Um, it's it's a residential product. We are primarily a residential ISP. So uh, it's a commo commodity, cheapest chips type. Thing. Uh, not saying we won't do it in the future, it's just, yeah, I, I don't think uh, getting to one gig at residential coverage is probably the first priority. And is, that the same reason, is that the same reason that you decided on the 1 to 64 <coughs> split on the kind of final last mile? Yeah, so uh, it's, again, that was less about our decision. That was the, pass the, the fiber company who decides the passive design. <coughs> so we are, we are consuming that as an unbundled product. So Again, there were some, com some commercials there. We probably could have negotiated some, but that's, that's their network, it's their topology. Okay, and then the question here. May have already answered my question, but I was uh, interested to see if you are using this only for internal consumption or if you are looking to wholesale out the product, like so were you building your EVPLs under sort of MEF compliant uh, uh, sort of uh, <laughs> build? Uh, the easy answer for that is at the moment, this is just uh, retail only. Okay, any other questions? Okay, a reminder to please identify yourself when asking a question. Uh, Martin Saunders from uh, Highlight. So I guess one of the nice things about having a whole new network is you can use lots of new features. How good have the vendors been in terms of actually delivering on something um, that may be on the paperwork but perhaps no one in the world is actually using? Yeah, so um, I'll let you know in, uh, in a few months. Um, <clears throat> so MAP is probably the biggest one for us that's quite zero day where, where no one else, we asked all of our vendors to provide us reference customers uh, uh, across the world and uh, all vendors pointed at one particular um, ISP in Canada and uh, they haven't actually deployed it at scale in production. So the map is probably about the biggest concern for us. The, um, uh, the other ones, so segment routing and EVPN, those are a little bit more mature. Um, I actually had a slide which I took out of this because uh, it was already too long um, and probably a bit unfair to a particular vendor, but we had an entire page of, of bugs that our testing guys did an amazing job uh, of, raising, of finding, raising, and most of them did actually result in a smooth sorry, uh, patch <coughs> um, or, or already had an existing patch for it. So uh, yeah, there were lots and lots of bugs. Um, Quite a few in uh, quite a few in EVPN, a little bit in segment routing, uh, only really one that was pertinent to the actual merchant silicon itself. But yeah, we've again done a lot of testing on them. Okay, um, we had one question here, and then um, and then the last one at the back there. Having finally got your hands on some V4 addresses, how few did you actually need in the end? And is, have you got a sort of how many you need per X number of customer ratio? Or? Yeah, so um, there's, there, there, there's regulations over there which uh, mean we cannot share larger than 16 to 1. Um, so that's what we're doing. Uh, again, we haven't actually started selling services for this yet. So um, there's a certain amount of, um, uh, of allocations per BNG based on topology. Um, and there's probably one thing I should uh, caveat I should raise. We are actually launching dual stack initially and then we have a, a focus of moving everybody over to to the MAPT solution or single stack v6 by the end of the year um, but just to de-risk some of our timelines we uh, we are launching dual stack sadly but cool thank you hi uh, Pete Crocker from Cumulus uh, you mentioned you've deployed SR and you mentioned you're looking at offline computation in the future. What are you doing? What are you using it for now? And how are you actually computing pads now? 
Uh, so we are, we are just using segment routing for the shortest path, basically replacing LDP across the network. Um, I didn't say we were looking at the offline path computation. The thing that we are looking at using uh, probably in the near future is using the link, um, uh, the link delay me metrics going through uh, ISIS. So we'll, we'll do some link um, delay uh, measurements, signal that by ISIS, and use that to build our SRTE uh, paths. Cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Richard.